I'd like to thank Bob for that lovely introduction. I don't know if I'm a world expert, but I know something about uh, point of care devices, which is what we'll be discussing for the next half an hour or so. So we're looking here about how we use these devices for assessing hemoglobin as well as the uh, maternal coagulation profile. So before we start, a few quick disclosures first. So I previously received some research support from Massimo Corporation. That's the company that manufactures the non-invasive hemoglobin technology in the US and also Hemonetics that manufactures uh, the thromboelastography devices. Okay, so what we're gonna aim to do over the next 30 minutes or so is provide ourselves with an overview of these key devices uh, for assessing um, the maternal hemoglobin concentration as well as the maternal coagulation profile. So we'll look at non-invasive hemoglobin technology, we'll discuss thromboelastography, or TEG, and rotational thromboelastometry, which is ROTEM. And then once we've looked at the mechanics of how these devices work, we'll consider how clinically useful they may be and whether we can apply or integrate them into our clinical obstetric anesthesia practice. So I'm sure there's probably at least a few of you in the audience that are probably wondering to yourselves, well, do I really need to bother with these devices when it's really quite easy for me to take a blood sample from the patient, put it in a tube or tubes, send it off down to the hematology lab, they can run the assays and then they can provide me with the hemoglobin concentration and also some coagulation indices. So why should I bother listening to a talk about these technologies? Well, the potential advantages of these devices are that you get, potent, uh, you get physiological data either at or near the patient's bedside. And some of these cases, such as the hemoglobin, uh, non-invasive hemoglobin monitor, you can get near real-time or real-time data because it's a continuous monitor. Now, both of these uh, attributes are important because, as we know from a clinical standpoint, if we're sending off blood to the lab, we incur time delays between the time when you remove blood from the patient until you get the result back from the hematology technician. Now, this might be a problem clinically because what this means is if you're dealing with a patient that has postpartum hemorrhage, you may, not be, you, know, you may not be able to afford to wait until you get the result back before you transfuse. And there's certainly data in the non-obstetric setting that suggests that in nearly a third of transfusions, there's no evidence of a hemoglobin trigger before the transfusion was given. So what this means is that these devices can help supplement and maybe even in an ideal world, replace the need for performing lab testing. And that's relevant for us because we can use these devices for either diagnosing anemia or coagulopathy, or if you're detecting either of these two conditions, you can use these for helping you determine how to best treat them. So from a logistical and also a practical standpoint, what um, are the other attributes that are relevant for clinical usage? Well, we're lucky because in this day and age, medical device manufacturers have to follow pretty strict FDA guidelines and regulations in order, before, uh, in order to ensure that they are safe for clinical use. But from our standpoint, we want to make sure that these devices are adaptable and convenient for us to use. So when you wander up to the um, device manufacturers uh, at the exhibit booths at big anesthesia meetings, you probably wonder, you're probably wanting to ask the following questions. Um, are these devices easy to use? Are they portable or handheld? And if they're not, can I easily house them on the countertop in a labor room or in the operating room? Uh, how much training and education is involved before I can successfully use the device? Um, do I need to learn how to assay the, if, I, if there's any assaying techniques that are needed to be used? And if the data results are given to me, how easy are the results for me to interpret? And then last but not least, there's obviously a cost involved in purchasing the devices and also the equipment for assaying. But probably of more relevance is cost effectiveness. And unfortunately, we really have very little data about the cost effectiveness of any of these, de of any, any of these devices, certainly in the obstetrical setting. Okay, so let's move on to look at non-invasive hemoglobin technology. Um, so the device that's probably attracted the most interest in the medical literature, and also from a medical standpoint, is this device manufactured by Massimo. This is the Rainbow Radical 7 Pulse Core Oximeter, and what you're seeing here on this slide are pictures from the first generation of the device. So if you cast your eyes over to the left-hand side, uh, sorry, on the right-hand side image, you can see the um, spectrophotometric adhesive sensor. And then below that is what looks like a white snake, and that's actually an interconnect that connects the sensor to another lead that connects to the base unit that you can see on the left-hand side. So the base unit converts uh, the signal into an electrical signal, which then provides you with a hemoglobin uh, concentration on the LCD of the base unit. Uh, 
How does the sensor work? Well, embedded in the sensor is a light emitter, which sends out more than seven different wavelengths of light. And after accounting for absorption within pulsatile and non-pulsatile tissue, any light that essentially gets through gets detected at the level of the photodetector. And then using a proprietary algorithm embedded in the processor within the device, it's able to compute the, uh, the hemoglobin concentration non-invasively. So on this slide, we can see sort of a typical type of setup when we're using this device from either a clinical standpoint or a research standpoint. So you can see the device is on the middle finger of the patient's left hand, and then the black sort of sheath or hood is, uh, is mounted on top of the probe in order to avoid interference with ambient light. And then the white thing that's coming out from underneath the, the black shield is the interconnect. The other thing you'll note is that the device is on the hand that doesn't have the IV or the blood pressure cuff to avoid interference. All right, so we've just sort of briefly run through how the device works and what it is. So what do we know about how the device performs in terms of accuracy and precision, uh, specifically within the obstetrical population? Well, the answer, unfortunately, is not very much. And the reason why is that there are really only a handful of studies that have attempted to uh, look at or assess device performance. And we'll look at some of these next. So back in 2012, we published a study where we looked at device performance within a pretty homogeneous cohort of patients. We took a, a series of patients who were undergoing elective caesarean section, were all healthy, term, and uh, had singleton pregnancies. And they were all scheduled to undergo elective C-section under a pretty typical, uncomplicated spinal or combined spinal epidural anesthesia technique. And what we were interested in is how the device uh, performed in terms of the hemoglobin values it was measuring compared to the lab values that we took at three different time points, before C-section and then immediately after C-section in recovery and then 24 hours after cesarean delivery. And the results were quite interesting. What we found was that the device appeared to overestimate the lab hemoglobin concentration both before C-section and then at 24 hours afterwards, so it overestimated it by at least one gram per deciliter, with some suggestion of, of, of there being a lot of variability, so question marks about precision. But yet, surprisingly, the, the bias appeared to be better or improved, so it's actually smaller, when we looked at the values immediately after C-section with less variability. So this is quite surprising, because one would have thought with blood loss and fluid shifts and changes in dynamic perfusion, that perhaps the device may have performed worse immediately after the C-section than it would do under more physiologically static conditions before C-section and then at 24 hours afterwards. So it's really hard to infer much about the data that we saw from the first generation of the device. We also, looked about, we also looked at the magnitude of the differences for each of, each of the observations that we took. Uh, we measured the SB hemoglobin value, that's the non-invasive hemoglobin value, and the lab value. So what we found was that in over 40% of the observations, the difference was less than plus or minus one gram per deciliter. However, in over 30% of the observations, the difference was somewhere between 1.1 and 2 grams per deciliter. And in nearly 20% of the observations, the difference was greater than plus or minus 2 grams per deciliter. So this is somewhat worrying, because what this means is that, is that in some patients, or in some of the observations, the device can be grossly overestimating or grossly underestimating what the actual hemoglobin concentration might be. There's really only been one other study that's done something similar. This is in the UK by Vanessa Skelton's group, where they took a much larger cohort, this time nearly 140 patients, and they did similar comparisons before and after C-section, but they threw in a third comparator. And this comparator was measuring hemoglobin with a HemaQ device. So this is another type of point of care device, but it's not providing you with continuous measurements. It's actually intermittent, and you do require a blood sample. So you pour blood from the patient, and you add a few drops into a plastic pipette. That's then, um, uh, well, then you pipette the blood into a plastic cuvette, which you then insert into this device, and it measures the hemoglobin concentration using a met az hemoglobin uh, reaction. So what did they find? So what they found was that in both cases before C-section, there was some evidence of overestimation of both devices when it measured the hemoglobin value, but the Massimo device appeared to do marginally worse. Whereas after C-section, you can see here that the Massimo values, uh, again, were uh, overestimating the hemoglobin, so the bias was much higher compared to what we saw with the HemaQ device. 
Note that there was a lot of variability when you look at the data in parentheses, which are the limits of agreement. They also looked at the percentage of measurements that were within plus or minus one gram per deciliter, which some people feel to be a clinically acceptable difference. And you can see here that in the majority of cases, the HemoQ device performed better than the uh, Massimo device. So at least based upon this study, what we can infer is that the HemoQ device may be better at providing you with more accurate values of the hemoglobin concentration compared to the Massimo device. But bear in mind that these studies were only done in healthy patients undergoing elective C-section where we're not estimating that a large amount of blood loss will occur. So it's really hard for us to know whether we're going to see similar types of results in patients with more comorbidity or in patients that have more severe blood loss. There's another type of device that the uh, company also produces, which is this device. This is called the Pronto 7. So it uses pretty much the same type of technology, but this time the device is used, being used intermittently. So it's being used for spot checks for measurement of the hemoglobin concentration. So you may use this type of device either in a clinic or perhaps on the postpartum floor when you're doing normal postpartum monitoring after a C-section or after a vaginal delivery. So how well does this device perform? And the answer again is we're not entirely sure, but the feeling is it's not that great, at least when you look at the first generation of this device. There's been two studies that have been published, both looking at uh, healthy pregnant cohorts, one, one in a cohort of around 20 weeks gestation, and one in women who are, about, uh, who are in the third trimester. And in both cases, you can see that the bias is over one uh, gram per deciliter. So the device is overestimating the lab hemoglobin concentration, but it doesn't take a genius to see that there's a lot of scatter in both graphs, which suggests that there may well be problems here with precision as well. So overall, what can we say about this type of technology? Well, the jury is officially out. I'm not sure it's really ready for prime time yet in terms of replacing the need for doing uh, a lab test for assessing the hemoglobin concentration. But perhaps these devices may actually be better as trend monitors, so assessing trend of change over time, or potentially for being used as screening devices. So if a device is recording a hemoglobin, say, for example, of about eight grams per deciliter in a patient that you may not have suspected of being clinically anemic, then that may prompt you to actually do a lab test in a patient that you may not have clinically suspected of being anemic. The future is changing, and as we know, with technology that uh, we're expecting a lot of technological improvements. The company is still trying to improve the software to improve accuracy and precision. And also, there's some suggestion that you can calibrate each device to each patient by doing in vivo calibration. But ultimately, what we really need here is more comparative effectiveness research to show whether the maternal outcomes are improved when you use these types of devices compared to standard of care. All right, so I think we're at the halfway mark now, so we'll take a big shift and we'll start to look at coagulation monitors and the uh, use of these devices in the field of obstetrics. So obviously what we're keen to do when we're looking after patients either in the OR or certainly during the period of labor and delivery is ideally what we'd like to do is maintain some level of hemostatic balance. So you want to avoid too much enhanced hypercoagulability that may prompt the patient to go to be in a category of being at increased risk of venous thromboembolism. And at the same time, you want to try and avoid any changes in the coagulation profile that may precipitate coagulopathy, which may uh, result in more severe blood loss after delivery. So there's probably, again, still a few of you in the audience, like Bob Kelso here from Scrubs, who are probably old school and probably saying to yourselves, well, I can take blood from the patient, right, and send it off to the lab, and they can provide me with coagulation indices such as the PT, the PTT, the INR, and the fibrinogen. So why should I bother with these point-of-care coagulation monitors? Well, the problem here is that there's a lot of evidence now accumulating in literature to suggest that standard plasma tests of coagulation are actually not very good at being predictors of or markers of perioperative coagulopathic bleeding. This is a very recent study that was published by a group of experts in hemostasis in the British Journal, and actually reviewed national and international guidelines about transfusion management. And over half of these guidelines, there was a recommendation to transfuse if there's at least a 1.5-fold increase in either the APTT or the PT. 
Now, when they did a systematic review, it was amazing that they found that there was no high quality evidence whatsoever to support the recommendations for this trigger. And in many cases, the, um, the recommendations from one guideline were being referenced from recommendations from another. So the feeling from these authors is that these tests are actually very, uh, very poor at being predictors of coagulopathic bleeding. And the strength of their feeling was such that in the final conclusion of their uh, manuscript, they state, it seems questionable how long physicians are willing to use these tests as markers of coagulopathy or guidance for bleeding management. But as always, old and even bad habits die hard. I'm not even, I don't think I've ever seen such a damning conclusion in any paper that I've ever read or reviewed uh, in the field of anesthesia. Okay, so if the experts feel that the use of these lab tests are questionable, are there any alternatives? And the answer appears to be yes. There is now more and more evidence accumulating, certainly in the non-obstetric setting, that the use of point-of-care coagulation monitors, such as rotational thromboelastometry, or ROTEM, and thromboelastography, or TEG, can be very useful for providing you with more granular and detailed information about the coagulation profile. Plus, you can get information back in a more timely fashion than what you'd otherwise do if you send off standard plasma tests. So much so that, as you'll hear probably in the next talk by John, now, these devices are now being referenced in practice guidelines from the American Society of Anesthesiology for perioperative blood management, and also by our European colleagues in their most recent guidelines for management of severe perioperative bleeding, and also by our friends in the UK who published guidelines uh, from the Obstetric Anesthetist Association that are recommending or at least referencing the use of technologies for assessing coagulopathy. And, it's, and there's more. There's a recent study in anesthesia suggesting that transfusion outcomes are improved if you use an integrated approach for goal-directed therapy using Rotem. And even our obstetrical colleagues are starting to at least appreciate, God bless them, the fact that there are coagulation monitors that can help us and them when we're managing patients who are at high risk for um, postpartum bleeding, such as patients with accreta. So obviously times are changing, and these bodies are starting to appreciate that these devices may be, may be quite useful. OK, so how do they work? Well, as you can see here on this um, uh, picture of this schematic, there are similarities and some subtle differences between these two devices. So with TEG, you get, a sample of a, you get a sample of blood from the patient. You place it in a plastic cup, which we can see here on the diagram labeled 1. The cup is placed in a platform in the device, you lift the platform up, and then a pin attached to a torsion wire, which is labeled three, is then inserted into the well of the cup. You push go on the machine, the cup starts to rotate around a very small angle, and then clot starts to form between the inner wall of the cup and the, uh, and the pin. Now when this happens, this creates torque on the pin, which is detected by an electromechanical transducer system labeled 4, which converts this signal into an electrical signal, which, which is shown as a trace on a computer screen labeled 5. With Rotem, there are some similarities, but there's also some subtle and important differences. You still need to place a sample of blood within the cup, which is labeled 1, but instead of a pin, it's got actually a, uh, um, instead of a wire, there's a pin that, that goes into the cup that rotates. So the cup doesn't rotate, the pin does. So when clot starts to form within the well, this affects uh, torque on the pin, which is detected by an optical detector system labeled 4, converts this signal into an electrical signal, producing a trace on the computer screen labeled 5. Now the traces, when you stand back and look at them, look quite similar. Yes, the, the name of the parameters, the nomenclature for nearly all of the parameters are different with TEG compared to Rotem. But what essentially what both devices are doing are providing you with very granular information about clot formation and clot lysis. So the information that you can get uh, includes information about the initiation of clot formation, the degree of fiber and polymerization, and the degree of clot strength, which is influenced by platelets and fibrinogen. So when we're looking at clot strength, if we're using TEG, we'll be measuring the maximum amplitude, or the MA. If we're using Rotem, we'll look at maximal clot firmness, or MCF, with Rotem. It can also produce information about clot lysis as well, uh, which is labeled CL, or lysis LY, with Rotem. Now, can these devices di differentiate the clot profiles in pregnant versus non-pregnant patients, because that would be important, right? If you want to make sure that at least it can detect changes associated with a hypercoagulable state associated with pregnancy. And the answer appears to be yes. 
This is early work that was done by Phil Steer and colleagues, and what he did was he compared the TEG profiles in patients who were non-pregnant with two cohorts who were pregnant. So what we're seeing here on this graph, the innermost curve the thick, and the, with a thick black line is from the cohort of women who are non-pregnant, and the two outer lines are from pregnant cohorts. So you can see here that there are differences with the eye of faith, that the, uh, the pregnant cohort curves are thicker, and they're wider, and they start much earlier if you look at where they start on the horizontal line. So there's an earlier initiation of clot formation, more fibrin polymerization, and a greater degree of clot strength, which we know teleologically is associated with a hypercoagulable state of pregnancy. We see similar differences if we were to use Rotem as well. So if you look at the bottom two traces, these are traces from Rotem from a pregnant cohort, and the top two traces are from a patient who is non-pregnant. And again, if you just look at them, eyeball them, you can see that the bottom two traces look much fatter than the top two traces. XTEM, if you're wondering, is uh, they're looking specifically at the extrinsic pathway, and FibTEM, they're looking at the fibrinogen contribution to clot strength uh, as a separate trace. So again, you can see differences when you look at the pregnant trace versus the non-pregnant trace with both devices. All right, so with that being said, are they any good at identifying abnormal hemostasis or coagulopathy? And again, the answer appears to be yes. The nice thing with both of these devices is that they produce different traces when there's a problem, and depending upon the type of trace, that can indicate what the underlying etiology is for coagulation disturbance. So for example, if there's a patient that has a low fibrinogen level, you'll see a trace that looks like this with TEG. So you'll see a decrease in the alpha angle, uh, a decrease in fibrin polymerization, and a decrease in the maximum amplitude or clot strength. If the patient continues to bleed, then they may become more hypercoagulable, where you see loss or dilution of clotting factors, platelets, and fibrinogen. So you can see clot initiation taking much longer, a uh, lower degree of fibrin polymerization, tough word to say, and, uh, and a decrease in the clot strength. And if you're really unlucky, then you may see a trace that looks like this. Uh, so this is primary fibrinolysis or hyperfibrin lysis, which you can sometimes see in patients who rarely have coagulopathy associated with, say, a severe placental abruption or with an amniotic fluid embolism. So this, this looks like a, a snake that swallowed a Foley bulb. You probably remember that analogy. So you're seeing a lot of uh, clot lysis happening at a very early stage compared to a normal hemostatic profile. All right, so can these devices be used to detect changes in terms of the coagulation profile um, in patients who have postpartum hemorrhage compared to healthy patients who don't have bleeding? So this is some interesting work that was referenced earlier on by Lisa by the Carlson Group in Scandinavia. And what they did is they took TEG traces in patients who were pregnant and compared them to TEG traces in patients that had postpartum hemorrhage. So you've got a postpartum hemorrhage trace at the bottom and a normal pregnant trace at the top. And again, if you just eyeball them, they don't look the same. So you can see here that the trace at the bottom looks much skinnier, so there's lower clot strength. And also with the eye of faith, you can see that the this trace starts later than the normal trace. So there's longer reaction time, a longer time to clot initiation, and a skinnier or a shorter MA. So there's problems here in terms of either a decrease in platelets or a decrease in fibrinogen. The other thing they did is looked at the associations between the maximum amplitude, that's the maximum clot strength, and the fibrinogen, and lo and behold, there's a strong association here. And also they found evidence of a good association, albeit inverse, when you look at the maximum amplitude and the EBL. So as the blood loss goes up, the clot strength with TEG goes down, which is what you would normally expect. If we were to use Rotem, we'd see something which is very similar. So here we have the bottom two traces which show uh, traces from a patient who has obstetric coagulopathy and the top two traces from a patient who is otherwise normal with no bleeding. And again, the traces at the bottom look skinnier than the traces at the top. So there's problems here in terms of clot strength and also problems here in terms of prolonged clot initiation. So these are the type of traces that you may well see if you're dealing with a patient that has postpartum hemorrhage before you've initiated treatment. The other important thing to note with Rotem is that you can get early information about clot strength, so you can measure the amplitude at five minutes, that's the A5 value, which is really helpful because you'll get information very early on about whether there's a problem with clot strength, which may be influenced by fibrinogen, certainly much sooner than you would do if you sent off a fibrinogen test to the lab, which with the best one in the world takes about 20 minutes or 30 minutes at least. <laughs> 
Now that's really important because as Lisa mentioned earlier on, there is strong evidence to show that in patients who have um, bleeding early after delivery, if you measure the fibrinogen level and it's found to be low, this is a very strong predictor for patients going on to develop severe postpartum hemorrhage compared to if the fibrinogen level is found to be within a more acceptable range of values. And remember, when we mean acceptable, we mean probably a value above 300 milligrams per deciliter. So if the fibrinogen level is around 200, 220, that's actually low for pregnancy. That's a red flag. If you're not worried about that patient, you should probably be starting to worry if it's being identified during the early phase of bleeding. So can these devices be used to provide you with early information about a potential decrease in the fibrinogen level? And the answer seems to be yes. This is a really important study that came out by Peter Collins' group that was published in Blood last year, which shows that the amplitude measured at five minutes with FibTem on the Rotem device is able to equally or equivalently discriminate between patients that then go on to develop severe PPH as, as a normal or as a standard fibrinogen concentration measured in the lab might be. So this is more evidence to show that these tests can be useful for prediction, and hopefully what we'll see in the future is more evidence to show that these devices can help us from a therapeutic or a management standpoint. Okay, so we're close to the end of the talk now, and overall all we can say about point of care devices is that they, are, uh, they do have value in terms of identif identifying hemostatic changes and abnormalities. The information that you get back can come back much sooner than standard lab tests of coagulation, which we question in terms of some of their clinical facility for perioperative bleeding. However, it does require training and education to interpret and use the devices. So what we hope to see in the future, certainly in the field of obstetrics, is more studies to validate the usefulness of these devices for clinical therapy. And again, as we saw with the, um, the points of care hemoglobin technologies, more evidence to show that with comparative effectiveness research, that they can improve outcomes compared to standard of care approaches. So I don't know if we're at the point yet where we're like bones from Star Trek where we can wave a black box over the patient, detect what the problem is, and make it go away, but I think we're getting there. Um, so I thank you all for your attention, and uh, I'd be delighted to take any questions later on in the talk. Mm -hmm.